Hard to believe it. But it's the final non-conference home game of the season, and it's the worst team the Tar Heels will play all year. Yeah, even worse than Louisville. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, December 13th, 2022. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making us your first listener watch of the day to make sure you get your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Sling TV. Don't miss tonight's matchup of North Carolina hosting the Citadel right there on ESPN2. Sling, the TV you love for a price you love. Try it today. Well, indeed, coming up tonight, UNC hosting the Citadel, 7 o'clock Eastern on ESPN2. Last time these two teams played, the leading scorer was Hubert Davis. That's right. It's been a minute since they've squared off, but the Tar Heels are indeed 19-0 all-time against the Citadel. Their most wins against any opponent without a loss. Now, here's the thing about the Citadel. They're 275th at Ken Palm. There's 363 teams in all of Division I, so they're not good, frankly. (laughs) And you might think, why is Carolina playing such a bad team? Well, here's what you need to know about the Tar Heels so far this season. And so I want to unpack this a little bit, and then here in a little bit we'll get to actually previewing the game itself. But I just want to continue to give a little context to the beginning of the season to give us some better understanding of what the Tar Heels have been doing. Because a lot of people look at what Carolina's done and say, hey, there was the four-game losing streak, but even in the five games before that, Carolina didn't always look stellar or awesome. Well, part of that is because Carolina wasn't just playing throwaway teams like a lot of uh, programs around the country were doing. You look, and I've done all this homework, so just believe me when I tell you that um, whereas a lot of the other top 25-ish teams in the nation played multiple teams outside the 200s at Ken Palm in the non-conference port of their schedule, North Carolina is yet to play a team that is sub-200 in Ken Palm rankings. The Citadel is going to be the first and only one in the non-conference port part of the schedule. No other top 25 team, I know Carolina is not top 25 right now, but you get my point. No other top 25 team in the nation can claim the same. As an example, North Carolina, per Ken Palm, has the 19th most difficult non-conference, or conference, sorry, let me say that differently, because Carolina has now played two conference games. To this point, per Ken Palm, Carolina has the 19th most difficult schedule in the nation. And amongst Power 5 schools, they have the fourth most difficult record behind only Michigan State, Oregon, and Wisconsin. Why is it important to make that distinction? Well, obviously, a lot of the mid-major and major teams are going to play a more difficult early season schedule because they're trying to schedule up for buy games to make money. And a lot of the major, the power five teams aren't going to do that. So the fact that Carolina rates that highly is really impressive. So just keep that in mind when you think, oh, woe is me. The Tar Heels have not performed well, and they they certainly haven't. But context, you got to realize some context with it. Further example of this, prior to heading out to Portland for the PKI, Carolina played four games, all home games. That was against um, UNCW, Charleston, Gardner-Webb, and James Madison. Now, Gardner-Webb is not a good team. If I remember, last I looked, and I can look real quick as we're talking, they have only won one game all season. Uh, No, they're up to two. They beat North Carolina, A&T, and Western Carolina. Other than that, they have seven losses. So Gardner-Webb's not good. But outside of them, Carolina's other three opponents, Charleston, UNCW, and James Madison are all top 15 mid-major teams this season. And that's not just me throwing numbers out there. That's like by people that rank uh, mid-majors. Charleston is the top mid-major in the entirety of Division I. Um, UNC Wilmington, James Madison also in the top 15. So hear me saying, Carolina is not playing 
cupcakes with this non-conference schedule. And so when you hear somebody say, yeah, Carolina not only had those four losses, they struggled with their uh, the their earlier kind of cupcake games. Yes, Gardner-Webb was a cupcake game, and Carolina didn't win it by much. So take that. <laughs> But outside of that, those other three home opponents to start the season, very good basketball teams that very well could find their way into March Madness. Obviously, Charleston and UNC Wilmington probably both won't both do that because they're in the same conference and probably just a one bid league. But you hear my bigger point. So all that to say, when you hear people talking about, oh, Carolina, I don't know, just say, hang on, buckaroo. Why don't you go take a look at those mid-majors that they're playing? And so for me, I've said quite often this early season that I'm encouraged by what Carolina has done, even though the results haven't been great either to the eye test or actually losing basketball games. But now that you've had this time at home, you're playing at home again tonight against Citadel, who again is the worst team on paper you play all season. Yes, even as bad as Louisville has been this season, the Citadel is ranked worse than Louisville is. And so um, to me, this is a big opportunity for North Carolina to find out, hey, what happened really well against Georgia or really good that we did against Georgia Tech? And how do we kind of build on that and cement some of that against a lesser opponent? is part of that question to that point against Georgia tech. I was just talking about those mid majors. Two of those three are actually ranked higher at Ken Palm than Georgia tech. That'd be Charleston and um, James Madison. I believe it was, I think it's UNC Wilmington. That's ranked uh, just slightly behind Georgia tech. Yeah. 128 Georgia techs, 123 at Ken Palm. But again, Charleston and James Madison are both in the top 100 at Ken Palm. So I'm not too concerned there. But anyway, this opportunity against Citadel is a chance to say, hey, what did we find right against Georgia Tech? And once again, in, in the last 12 minutes against Virginia Tech last Sunday, and how do we cement some of that with what we do against the Citadel on Tuesday night? Well, we're going to unpack that more fully here in just a moment. But before we do that, this episode is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Yes, give me all that noise. Christmas is just under two weeks away, but I can already taste the incredible steak our family is going to eat together on Christmas Day as we gather around the table. It's something we do every time our family comes together at Christmas, and this year is no different. Listen to this insane deal. Omaha Steaks has cut prices 50% site-wide to make you the gift-giving hero that you always wanted to be. The holidays are here, and you can achieve gifting greatness when you give the gift of perfectly aged tender and delicious Omaha steaks, which has everything you need to give a gift that's simply perfect. Send an assortment of mouth-watering favorites like the delicious butcher's cut filet mignon, air-chilled boneless chicken, ultra juicy burgers, and even easy to prepare comfort meals that are ready in a flash. So don't wait, order today and beat that shipping rush. Go to omahasteaks.com, use promo code locked on to check out. Omaha steaks is a gift from the heart that will be remembered with every unforgettable bite. Order with complete confidence right now, knowing that you're ordering the very best. In fact, visit omahasteaks.com and take advantage of 50% off site-wide. Plus, you can use promo code Locked On at checkout to get an extra $40 now. They've bumped it from $30 up to $40 off your order. Minimum order may be required. Boy, good stuff there. I can taste it. My mouth is watering. Yikes, I need it right now. Okay, so in this game against Citadel, as we do with our Four Corners recap, I want to give you my Four Corners preview, just four things that I'm really watching for in this game. And it's one of those games where you say, you know, ordinarily I'd like, hey, here's what you're watching for with the opponent, how they might perform. No, nah, not in this game. This is about saying, here's what Carolina just needs to do, right? Um, it, because of how bad the Citadel is, it's that rare opportunity for North Carolina to go out and just try stuff, work on different lineup combos. Maybe there are things you tried in practice last week that you couldn't put in yet against Georgia Tech, but you can't against Citadel. Um, now's your chance to do those things. That's what I'm looking for Carolina to do. So let me give you four specific things. Number one is simply to build on what you did against Georgia Tech on Saturday. Now, uh, <laughs> I've gotten a couple comments, some feedback 
from people like, oh, that wasn't a great performance Saturday. Uh, like, Isaac, you're overhyping it. Maybe so. But I, and, and I recognize I'm not dumb. Carolina was not perfect in that game. There's more to work on. But it was an infinitely better performance, an infinitely more consistent performance across the game. There were no moments where I felt like Carolina was checked out. I thought they were dialed in from tip to final buzzer. So again, a better performance, not a perfect performance, but something to build on. I think we can all get together around that, right? Like you can at least agree with me there, even if you won't go as far as I am willing to do at this point. The other thing is you don't want to overlook the Citadel, but it is an opportunity to think ahead to some of what Ohio State is going to do on Saturday at Madison Square Garden in the CBS Sports Classic, because that is a D1, uh, excuse me, a quad one opportunity that you have in front of you. And you want to make sure that you are prepared to do that. And so uh, we talked on Monday show about some of, the, some of the things that Carolina did better against Georgia Tech and how they can build on those things. So Carolina had a season high against Georgia Tech in rebounding margin. Can they go out once again and just dominate the Citadel? Carolina had their best assist percentage of the season against Georgia Tech. And we know that's been a point of emphasis. And we know that the players are talking well about that. It was 15 of 27 for a 55.6% uh, assist rate on Saturday against Georgia Tech. Can Carolina even grow in that? have a higher assist ratio in this game points in the paint Carolina had allowed 40 or more in each of the previous three games finally held uh, Georgia Tech in the 20s in this game and so uh, looking can you build on that Carolina has done something they've done really well is getting to the free throw line and connecting from the free throw line while they're there this season they're one of the um, I, I forget the number. I was looking at it the other day. Maybe I can find it while we're talking, but one of the top teams in the country at getting to the line. And so that is an important thing there. I, I can't find it and I'm, I'm looking, but I, I don't want to get distracted from what we're talking about. But Caroline is doing really well getting to the line and are very high nationally in doing so. Not to mention, they're connecting at a 75% rate when they get there. And so that's two seasons in a row they've been shooting that high a percentage from the free throw line. Keep in mind, last year was the second highest team free throw percentage in Carolina history. And so they're right on that path again. You want to see Carolina keep getting to the line and keep capitalizing on that. Number two in our Four Corners preview, the thing I'm watching for is how does Coach Davis deploy Jalen Washington? If you were watching on Saturday, Washington got in for the first time, played the final two minutes and 22 seconds of this game, his first appearance um, in long, long, long time, missed his entire senior year of high school. And so um, is he ready to play more minutes on tonight on Tuesday? You certainly hope so. I don't think you expect him to go 20, 25 in that range, but could you bump him up to 10 or something like that? Because Jalen Washington, different than getting like another guard or wing, is you just don't really have anybody behind Baycott and Pete Nance. And so if Jalen Washington can and does become a legit um, depth piece in the post, and, and even beyond that, not just depth, but like somebody who can step out and knock down shots as we are expecting to see somebody who can hold their own and have good touch in the paint as we already saw with that one uh, shot attempt on Saturday that he made for his first points of his career I'm looking for that from Jalen Washington this is really because after this it's Ohio State it's Michigan and then it's ACC play the rest of the season so this game tonight is really your only chance to get learning minutes for Jalen Washington to see like how he handles himself in more extended time playing. So really curious to see how Coach Davis utilizes him tonight. Number three, uh, whereas several of the things I talked about in the first point were areas that Carolina improved against Georgia Tech, the three-point shooting just is still not there. The Tar Heels as a team are under 30%, 28.8%. Caleb Love, down under that individually. At some point, he's going to get on track. Do you believe it? Maybe tonight is the night for that. Um, but uh, like to to that point about Caleb Love shooting, I read an article from ESPN on Monday, and it was kind of like this anonymous uh, thing from various coaches around the country. 
just saying, hey, like, what's wrong with Carolina? And one of the main talking points was the three-point shooting. And at the end, uh, a coach said this. And this has a certain four-letter word that starts with F in it. I'm not going to say it. I'm going to skate right past it, but you'll understand the point. This opposing coach says, the shots Love took in the Alabama game, he might as well just drop kick the ball at the rim and say, it. Teams that aren't great shooting teams shouldn't hunt those shots early in the shot, in the clock, but they shoot it like they're the Splash Brothers. And honestly... I can't fault what this coach is saying, right? Like that is what the Tar Heels and particularly Caleb Love have been doing, taking early shot clock threes that you could get at any point in the shot clock and he's not connecting. And so it, it's just, it's not in rhythm. It's not in the pace of the offense. Now, something he did well against Georgia Tech was make more, like he was the leading assist man, things of that nature. I'm looking for that Caleb Love. Is he willing to shoot less while he's not shooting well? Um, for the betterment of the team, quite frankly. We're going to have to see on that. It Will the three-point shooting improve? Carolina has only made three threes in each of the last two games. That's got to improve at some point. And then the fourth thing I'm watching out for is how's Armando Baycott's health? Um, he appeared okay against Georgia Tech. Was he perfect? No. Did it seem like his shoulder was still ailing him? Yes. Uh, did he still finish with a double double 21 and 13? Yes, that is also true. Now, against a team like Citadel, you expect him to dominate if Coach Davis chooses to play him. With all these massive games coming up, ah, this, is a, this is an opportunity I might take to sit my star again. Now, if he's healthy and good to go, play him. Absolutely. Keep get because part of it is you saw he was a little bit rusty um, against Georgia Tech. And so if you if if Armando's good to go, get him some minutes and let him get some of that game action. But get him off his feet. Get Jalen Washington more minutes. Um, give Carolina opportunity to see, hey, like, what do we got to do to be successful if Armando's on the bench in foul trouble? Stuff like that. So I, I expect him to play. I've heard nothing at this point to the contrary. But just keep an eye on how he's progressing and doing. I, again, expect him to be just a dominant force in the paint in this game. And watch for Carolina to continue to force feed him the ball in healthy ways. But Carolina has to do that right now due to their lack of shooting. they got to get the ball into Baycott. He's got to be able to either put it up or distribute in healthy ways to help get better looks from deep. Well, sometimes the way sports works we're talking about very happy and wonderful things. Sometimes life takes over and sports necessarily has to take a backseat. That is the case of what happened Monday as we heard some very disturbing news about Texas head basketball coach Chris Beard. I do want to unpack some of that news. I know it's not North Carolina specific, but when life happens, it's the kind of thing that I believe we as sports fans and people that care about what's going on need to discuss the humanity in some of this. We're going to do that right after I tell you about Built Bar. I'm talking about Built's new reimagined flavors, cookie dough topper, cooking, coconut brownie bar, coconut brownie topper, or how about the white chocolate peppermint granola? It's Built's take on the granola bar, so it's more filling and insanely tasty. And candy cane brownie puff? Come on, Built Puffs are like biting into the universe's most delicious cloud. So for anyone who hasn't tried Built Bars before, they're literally the best tasting protein bars out there on the market. They're revolution, revolutionizing nutrition as we know it with 100% real chocolate, 17 grams of protein, and shockingly low sugar and just 130 grams of, or 130 calories. So sink your teeth into that first bite and it's going to change you. You're going to try to be like, hey, there was a time before I had ever tasted Built Bar and I don't remember what that life was like. You're probably wondering which one is my new favorite. Honestly, it's an unanswerable question. And so if I'm doing it, I'm going to get one of those mixed boxes so I can try all five of these new delicious flavors for myself. Built. You got to try this. Get 15% off your order right now by using the code LOCKEDON15 at built.com. Well, as I alluded to, we woke up to some rather disturbing news on Monday morning that Texas head basketball coach Chris Beard had been arrested on assault charges. It is not my point or intention here on the show to discuss the specifics of the police report. It's out there if you want to go find it for yourself and read it. I don't want to sensationalize or highlight 
the issues of what happened specifically or what he did. Just know that it is not befitting of anyone and definitely not a Division I men's basketball head coach. Uh, there was a day and age prior to this when that sort of behavior might have uh, been, I wouldn't necessarily say overlooked, but been able to be swept under the rug. But we are in a day and age where we must and can, and now thankfully do, hold people in positions of authority accountable for these types of decisions that they make. Now, to be fair, at this point, all we have are allegations. He has been charged. Coach Beard has. He's been released on $10,000 bail. He did not coach in Texas win, uh, overtime win, I should say, over Rice on Monday night. It took a while for information to come out. Texas released a an initial just really brief terse statement just saying, hey, we're aware of what's going on and we're looking into it. Coach Beard's attorney said, uh, basically, I, I don't have that quote in front of me, um, but basically said he's innocent and the other person in question, who it turns out is his fiance, um, actually doesn't want to press charges. I've heard nothing that come out that says that that's true. And to the contrary, the, the police report has overwhelmingly seemingly damning evidence against coach beard. And at this point, obviously uh, there have been no, uh, you know, he's not been convicted in a court of law or anything like that, but here's what the university of Texas uh, released in their press statement about two hours or a little under two hours prior to tip off of that game on Monday night. Quote, the university takes matters of interpersonal violence involving members of its community seriously. Given the information available, the university has suspended Chris Beard from his position as head coach and will withhold his pay until further notice. Associate head coach Rodney Terry will serve as acting head coach for tonight's game against Rice, end quote. Uh, to me, it, from the outside looking in, it seems like Texas has handled this with all the proper protocols following the guidelines of what they should do. Uh, you've probably heard me say that I'm now the co-host of Locked On College Basketball's uh, show. And one of the things we did for today's show was interview the Locked On Texas host, Jonathan Davis. And he said from everything he saw and heard and read and people he talked to on Monday, Texas handled this um, up front. They handled it in the way that is befitting of a national reputable institution. And sounds like they have lived up to that. Now, obviously, we're going to continue to monitor it and see how they do. But here's uh, part of what's interesting to me is I think so often we fall into the trap of making this all about the coach or the team and that type of thing. And, and listen, I don't want to not make it about Coach Beard or the Texas Longhorns basketball team or the coaching staff or um, support crew, any of that. Obviously, if, if these allegations are true, our hope is that Coach Beard will be able to get the help he needs for whatever struggles and issues he has going on in his life. We obviously wish the best for the basketball team, the, the coaching staff and personnel as they try to figure out what this means for them for their season and what it looks like. Texas uh, with Chris Beard as their head coach is one of the best basketball teams in the country this season. But again, all of that pales in comparison to we have to put our focus on to who we know at this time to be the victim. Again, as things play out, that that news and information could change. But we have to always make sure that we are not victim shaming. We have to make sure that we are not doing things that paint this, this woman in a negative light and that take very seriously the allegations made, the, the physical marks on her body, and um, think of and pray for her, for her family, uh, her friends, and all those involved as well. So yes, because this is a sports podcast, we're going to talk a lot about um, coaches and teams when those issues arise. But hear me make this promise to you, my dear audience, that we will always on this show honor and support those um, who need honor and support. I know that everyone has a voice, but we want to be part of a generation that helps give that voice um, amplification when it needs be done. We will never rush to judgment and we will not um, inappropriately 
put somebody into a box or a jail cell or whatever it is that they should not be in. But we will always take very seriously when matters um, come up that need to be take seriously, taken seriously. And that goes for North Carolina um, student athletes and coaches. They will not be above reproach. Neither will those of other schools. And I just thought it would be an appropriate moment for us to take a second to pause and to recognize what's going around the con- going on around the country. Speaking of difficult sports issues, you are probably also aware that Mississippi State and former Texas Tech head football coach Mike Leach is in very serious condition right now. As of this recording, um, he is still alive, but um, things do not look good. And so if you are a person of prayer, in addition to praying uh, for the, this woman who has been, uh, again, at this point, allegedly ab- abused by Coach Chris Beard, I would ask that you pray for her, for Coach Beard and um, any recovery or help he may need. But also, please be in prayer for Coach Mike Leach and his family as they go through this troubling time. Well, friends, that is it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Forgive me for ending on a somber note, but again, When life happens, sports necessarily take a back seat, and that's what we will always be about. Coming up on tomorrow's show, Coach Pat Kilby and I will unpack Carolina's game against the Citadel and uh, give you our our four corners takeaway, the shady stat of the game, and other things to follow up on. You can follow the show on on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow me at Isaac Shade. Would love to hear from you. Send an email to the show, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. I need suggestions for the heel of the week and the heel of the week. I've got a couple already. Love to see them coming in and would love to hear your thoughts as well on that. For your second listen of the day, check out Locked On Sports today. The biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, and of course, the take of the day. It's available on Odyssey, YouTube, and anywhere else you get podcasts. If you would, please subscribe to our show on YouTube or wherever you're listening. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button. would love to hear your comments on this upcoming game tonight against the Citadel. Really appreciate you hanging out with me, talking Carolina sports on a Tuesday. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel, right? Until tomorrow, peace.